man. A dead man's trigger is basically when you set up a condition where if something happens to you, there is such a cache of information that nobody has seen yet that would hit the media and hit the internet that you're better off alive. I was advised in uh, early 1990s to create this dead man trigger where if something were to happen to me or my team, my senior team, there would be information uh, and documents and other materials that would be released from multiple sites and for people who are plugged in to media and media companies and what have you uh, and it would be very hard to stop it. Now the reason for that is not that I'm trying to be so aggressive, is that you have to have a countermeasure to the threats. Whatever it is that people have seen that we put out so far, um, there's so much more. There's much more than the scope of a two hour film can contain or a hundred hours would contain. Uh, and some of it is, are, is information, documents, names, places, people. But it became very clear to me that, you know, you kind of had a tiger by the tail here and that this was serious. And it was serious enough that we put this dead man trigger in place right away. Remember the first time that you ever, during a meditation and and prayer for the healing of earth, which you do quite often, um, invited the ETs to join us in that. And that was in Mount Shasta in 1999. And That's as soon right. as you got to that part of the meditation, one of the members of our group was heard, heard the words in his head, look up, and there was this enormous ET craft moving over us. Yes, and in fact, that event, which we filmed, uh, is well, I didn't, but this gentleman did. Is is such an astonishing event because it was precisely at the point where we joined in with this whole interstellar community to put energy on the Earth for its healing and for its evolution to this time of universal peace and these new energy technologies coming out and the whole transformation of world civilization and uh, this beautiful half a million year cycle of universal peace that we're about to enter. And at that instant, literally, there was this massive, and it was two, it looked like a triangle with two points of light, like th three stars making a perfect equilateral triangle. And it moved in. It was so huge, some people couldn't see it because it was so big. And in between those three points of light, it wasn't solid. It was kind of opaque, so you could, it distorted the stars through it. And this object was so large and so far out in space that it was seen from Vancouver all the way down to L.A. and was reported, actually, uh, as such. It came three times out of the five nights we were there that week. And every time um, it came at that same point in your meditation? It came at the same point. We've since learned that this was an enormous craft that was in, on the order of hundreds to thousands of miles across. And it was very deep space, and it lit itself up in that configuration as a confirmation of what we were doing. But at the same time, it was, it's, it's, we, we have seen it at other times. Six months later, we were up in uh, upstate New York and had the, had the exact same craft come twice on the same night. And so it, it was sort of their way of saying, yes, this is exactly the kind of energy and philosophy and concepts that we want to interact with. Uh, we welcome all species, any race, any color, anyone from any star system. If they can get here and they're allowed off their planet, it means that they're peaceful. Because, how do I know this? We've tried to go off our planet. And the guardians of the universe have said, Niet, no, no, not going there yet, go home. This is, why, this is what Neil Armstrong meant when he said when we landed on the moon, the, cra the crater was crowded with extraterrestrial vehicles and they did not want us coming out there yet. Why? Because we were going out there as part of the Cold War. We were in a space race with the Russians. We were doing this within a paradigm of division and militarism and war. The entry ticket to going out into space is universal peace. Not just peace on earth, that's, that's too old, 
That should have been 100 years ago. Peace in the cosmos. Peace universal. And that's the time we're in, because that is the requirement of the current hour. It isn't enough to strive for world peace. It has to be universal peace. Because God help us if we unite the world around an Independence Day type scenario where all the people of the world are united in peace because we're fighting an interstellar civilization that's being masqueraded by the secret government with ARVs and what have you. Don't be fooled again. We have found, and we've had this confirmed by military and, and top secret people who've worked in uh, studying the extraterrestrial spacecraft that have been retrieved over the years, they have found that, in fact, uh, their technologies interface directly from thought to the machine. So it's not even about touching some dials. It's about they think and there's an actuation of that command in the spacecraft for guidance or for traveling through space. Very, very advanced technologies, and we're going to get into that and why it's so important that we understand this. Um, I remember one time in England, um, we were actually on Marconi Hill, which is uh, in Wiltshire, where Marconi sent the first telegram, in fact, and it was part of the Royal Trust lands, but we were up there and had permission to use it. And we were doing this um, uh, protocol for contact, and we were had done a deep meditation, and the whole group had gone into this state of unbounded mind, and then we had remote viewed deep space, and we had turned it around and vectored, as we call it, or, or guided these ET craft into the area. And about that time, we were then looking around at the sky, and it had cleared up, which is uh, nice for England. And suddenly, there was a very bright object that came over that looked like it could have been a very bright satellite. My intuitive remote viewing of it was that it wasn't. But there were some left brain engineer type guys there, and they said, oh, it's a satellite. And, they, and I said, well, let's ask it to do something a satellite absolutely can't do, because perhaps it isn't. So we sent that thought to it, and at that instant, I mean not five minutes later, but instantly, it stopped and made a right-hand turn and went shooting off into space. And everyone's mouths dropped open, and I said, see, this is what can happen. And it's, it's, an, it's, it's exactly the sort of thing we've had happen literally hundreds of times uh, over the last uh, decade or two. And it, it illustrates how precisely uh, thought can interface with these advanced extraterrestrial uh, beings and their spacecraft because their technologies all the time are scanning through that energy field that some have called astral or thought or conscious as easily as you and I pick up a cell phone or a regular telephone and call each other. There are three major steps to this. First, going into unbounded mind and the state of the samadhi, the relaxed state of mind. Secondly, to then actively remote view the presence and location of the extraterrestrial vehicles. And then third, to turn that into a vector, where you then connect with their electronics and their individuality and their craft and show them your location. So if you, let's say you see them out near Saturn, and there's a very huge craft out near Saturn now. I had a Defense Intelligence Agency general tell me about it a couple months ago. <laughs> he turned ashen white when he saw the images of it. Um, you know, one of the ones that we're tracking out in our solar system is 26 miles across. One ET vehicle, 26, it's the size of the LA basin. Anyway, so um, <laughs> believe me, if they were hostile, it would have been all over the time we, uh, believe me, before the monkeys started developing thousands of nuclear weapons. It would have been point, set, match over. You know, forget about the invasion stuff. Okay, um, the invasion will come from Lockheed Martin masquerading as ETs. This is the cosmic 9-11, the cosmic... Gulf of Tonkin that all of you have been programmed. You can be in the middle of a remote national park like we were in November. I think it's a good time to sort of mention this. And we had had an experience, uh, we've had many experiences this particular site up in Joshua Tree National Park. There's an area where we saw, well, why don't you tell them, Linda, what happened in 1996, the first time uh, you were there with our well, group? That was incredible. Um, we were at one location in the National Park, and it was about 1.30 in the morning, and we were getting ready to leave. And you had said earlier that the ETs would do something spectacular and fast, and they hadn't done it yet, really. So we, we were driving out, and you were in the vehicle ahead of me. I was following you, and suddenly the most astonishing thing, 
um, straight down from the zenith of the sky um, came this this craft that was the size of my fist at arm's length, and it was That's like big. <laughs> it, it was very it was one of the biggest things I've ever seen, and it was um, almost fluorescent, kind of teal and sparkling white, and in the shape of a Hershey's kiss, even with like the white paper at the top was you know kind of like white light, and it just came down straight. And as it approached the ground, it illuminated, as far as we could see, the whole the whole ground. And this was, I don't remember, about half a mile away from us, I think. And um, it illuminated the ground in white, and I expected to hear a loud crashing sound or something. It just, when it, it, it shifted phases, went into the ground, and, and um, you spotted the exact spot, and we drove to it very quickly. And about 15 of us saw that. Yes, and what's interesting is that that area has been where we've uh, had our contact site uh, since then for the last uh, 10 or 11, 12 years. And we'll be going back there actually in November. And we have had the most astonishing things happen uh, at that place. And we know that, uh, in fact, that this is where uh, there's a very strong extraterrestrial presence. I think probably there's probably uh, some facility underneath the earth uh, in that area of the National Park because it's protected. When I started this project in 1990, there were weapon systems in space that were STI cover weapons. The SDI program, the Star Wars programs, was a cover for these weapons targeting ET vehicles. Now, 20 years later, they have gone up exponentially in their efficacy. They actually were in orbit by 1965. There's a man on our team who actually worked with Hughes Aerospace and some of the other big industries back in the mid-60s here in, in, in the LA area who helped put these weapons in space and design them. And these are using not missiles like you think of a bullet shooting at something. They're using what I described earlier, and these are these electromagnetic weapons that can actually completely destroy something faster than the speed of light because the scalar longitudinal weapons go faster than the speed of light. A couple of years ago, we were at this uh, contact site we have at jo in Joshua Tree National Park, and where we'll be going again in November. And what's interesting is that we had been in this uh, circle in our uh, meditation, and I was doing a guided meditation. And we were at this point where we're doing sort of a healing meditation and prayer for the earth and for universal peace. At that moment, a craft emerged from the area where we had seen this one land in 96 into the desert. And in fact, it was so bright it lit up the whole desert then. But it was in the air about 15 to 20 feet above us. And it, it appeared and was completely materialized. It came over the west side of the group, just above one of the Joshua trees at that side of the circle. And it had the strangest sound to it. It was like wow, 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 like that. And it was so close that if I'd stood on my chair and jumped up, I probably could have touched the underside of it. And then it got to the other side of our circle. So we're talking 30, 40, 50 feet and dematerialized, literally vanished in thin air. Well, it didn't vanish. It was still there. What it did is that its resonance frequency shifted back across the crossing point of light beyond the speed of light. And so they can phase in and out. It's sort of like, I, I tell people like those old radios, like you can tune, t t dial the, the, the station and you can sometimes hear one station and then another and you can get between them and there can be both. Well, often we will see that they will be kind of between the two where they'll not be solid materialized, but they won't be completely invisible. They'll be this sort of scintillating, almost astral energy field that you'll see that's in the shape of a craft or a being that will be literally in the field with us. And people you know, have to blink and say, what am I seeing here? Two-thirds of the group Majestic, the Magi group, that are keeping this secret in the military-industrial complex support disclosure. But the other third will eat their own. And that's why it's still not officially acknowledged. But we're making progress, believe me. We've gone from a third to two-thirds of the secret organizing entities in support of disclosure. Now, you say, well, isn't that the majority? I say, yeah, but this isn't a democracy in this group. All right? The one-third who are the hardliners are also the one-third 
that like to kill people. They're the ones who are the eschatologists who want to see the world go through a, a, a collective death experience. They're the ones who worship destruction. They're the ones who want to see us go to uh, World War III. They're the ones who, when someone in their own group steps out of line, like former CIA Director Bill Colby, who is going to provide for my group an operational free energy device and $50 million in seed money to get it out to the world. This was in the mid-90s. They found him floating down the Potomac River the week he was going to meet with a member of my board. That's welcome to my life. Let's set the stage here, which is kind of where I wanted to introduce this. We were out in the center, the dead center of Joshua Tree National Park, uh, 20, 30 miles from any civilization, any source of microwave towers or anything like that. And these uh, detectors that we have that give this electronic tone, they don't go off just for, you know, if you, you walk by them or something. They, they, they require um, that they be hit with like a police radar scope or some high source of microwave tower or what have you. And <laughs> normally at this site, it's completely silent. The detectors don't do anything until we start having contact. And then, of course, when we have contact, not always, but frequently, there's this amazing amount of energy that is in the area that's, uh, and, and I want to explain how this is happening. The extraterrestrial vehicles and their communication systems are usually phasing faster than the speed of light, which, of course, would not make a radar detector go off. But they can step it down to where it's then moving against the linear space-time continuum and begins to hit the electromagnetic field. And as it hits the electromagnetic field around us, it can very specifically make those detectors go off, so much so that one will go off uh, and one three feet away will not. Or one that's three feet away will go off in a different spectrum of the electromagnetic, where it's X-band or K-band or laser band than the other one. Now, this is impossible. If this was coming from a man-made source like a police cruiser or a ranger or something like that, it would be the same spectrum at the same time, particularly when they're that close together. And so it's very, very, very anomalous electromagnetic evidence of what's going on uh, frequently with objects in the sky that the group has seen or a craft that's moving across space that we're filming with our night scope or what have you. And that's what happened this week, and it happened for five hours with these right. detectors, yeah. uh, a total of about five hours of continuous uh, and the transmissions, the electromagnetic beeping you hear, are actually just um, evidences of <clears throat> packets of uh, information that's being communicated into consciousness. And while these things were beeping, while all these detectors were beeping, um, I was in a state of consciousness where I was uh, super awake, if you can use that concept, or in a state of cosmic consciousness. At where the packets were coming in, and then I was able to translate what the meaning of the packets of information were uh, in sequence so that they would beep and I would translate and then it would go on. This went on for hours, and we actually have a very good recording of that. We're calling these the Orion transmissions. And it was, uh, of course, 40 some people observed this, and it was um, a life altering experience, I think, for everyone who was there.
we are being visited by multiple interplanetary civilizations. They work together. Some of them are 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 7th years more developed than we are, meaning in the hundreds of thousands to millions of years more developed. Uh, others, maybe a few thousand years down the path from where we are, none of them are hostile. They are all, however, concerned with our hostility. So I'm going to put up a great big cosmic mirror, and it's like the man in the mirror thing. And imagine that you've been observing Homo sapiens develop over the last few thousand years from tribal to nation state to big na nations. And you've seen conflict go from clubs and spears to thermonuclear weapons. And in the classified projects, the scalar weapons. Everybody saw the spiral over Norway? That was a scalar weapon, man-made, that was a shot across the bow to warn President Obama to stay away from the subject because we had just put together the briefing for him. I remember being at Colonel Corso, uh, the, the man who wrote The Day After Roswell, and at his home back some years ago, and there was a whole lot of materials that he had there that had not been published and never, I suspect at this point, never will be. He's passed away now. Um, but one of the things that I learned was that back in 1956, he was at uh, White Sands uh, in that area at, uh, where we set off the first nuclear bomb at Trinity Site and uh, Holloman Air Force Base. And uh, there were a lot of ET craft that were uh, coming in because they were very concerned about us developing uh, atomic weapons and the, the potential to destroy the Earth, but perhaps also us being a threat down the road to other civilizations. And uh, we, we were using high-powered radar systems to attack and scramble the electronics on these ET craft once they became materialized. And that's why the one in Roswell crashed. I mean, the, the one in Roswell didn't just crash. It was actually targeted with these electromagnetic type of weapon systems that have been developed and have been known in classified programs since at least the 20s and 30s. Well, Corso had saw one of these come in on radar and then saw it come down out in the white sands, out on the range far away. So he hopped in his Jeep, went out there, and he uh, saw this craft that was uh, uh, disc-shaped, uh, and it was completely shiny, metallic, present. And then it would suddenly vanish, and all he would see would be look like a heat wave, a, sw a sort of a swirling like you see a mirage when it's really hot on a road, but you could see straight through it. And then it would totally rematerialize and then do that and did it back and forth and back and forth as if it was teaching him about the nature of, of their technologies. Finally, it stayed materialized and an ET beam appeared outside of it with one of these little communication devices and that communicated directly through thought to Colonel Corso and basically asked the colonel to switch off these high-powered radar systems that had been designed to interfere with the electronics of these ET craft. And Colonel Corso, being a brash young uh, uh, military guy, said, well, what's in it for me? And it, the ET said, a new world, if you can take it. You need to know the truth of who's playing with your mind and why this information has been stopped. They are desperate for people to have a new enemy. Because, look, there are 70 al-Qaeda in all of Afghanistan, this by the acknowledgement of the CIA, 7-0. This, we have 140,000 troops chasing at a cost of over 100 billion a year. Come on. You know, they have to keep this machine alive. And the next big thing to play is the alien card. And we're about a minute, a nanosecond from that. Don't be fooled again. And this is why I am the most hated person in the UFO field. It's because I am absolutely, have the, the data, I have the documents, I have the witnesses that, in fact, there are abduction squads being run by secret government human entities using program life forms and ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles, and very advanced electronics. This is not a conspiracy theory. It is exactly what's happening, and this is why you have all been diseducated. Not miseducated, deliberately diseducated. For the purpose of preparing you, and the new age and UFO subculture is the vanguard of those 
purveying this information to others, ironically. So you have all become the carrier vehicles, not all of you, many of you, have become the carrier vehicles for launching interplanetary war. What great news. Now, because I'm here in Los Angeles, and it's the 50th anniversary of a beautiful lady a passing named Marilyn Monroe, the French of Marilyn Monroe was. Um, I want to have a document here. Now, this is the kind of thing I get fairly routinely. And this is a top secret document. It has not been declassified. It's been authenticated by a man who used to be General Odom's right hand man, the head of the National Security Agency, who now is a lecturer at the University of Maryland, and who wishes to remain confidential. So I got this document from someone whose family was at the beginnings of the National Security Agency, NSA. And in it, it's a wiretap. And the agency, the CIA, was tapping Marilyn Monroe's phone. And in the process, she was on the phone because she was frustrated at having kind of been dropped by the Kennedy brothers. Um, and she was gonna tell the public in a big press conference, the whole world would have listened to this one, about what Kennedy had told her. And if you read, look at this, about the objects from New Mexico, from outer space, and this spacecraft with the dead bodies. This is going on and on. This is about Roswell. It is a smoking gun. Project, it has Project Moondust, Project 46, and look at the signature. James Jesus Angleton III. He was the chief mole hunter who stopped leaks at the CIA at this period. And this was Marilyn Monroe's death warrant. But what happened was that they, she was going to do this press conference. And so they made it look like a suicide, and they killed him. I also have someone who won't come forward, who way back then was in the intelligence unit of the LA Police Department, operated because of going on. You have to ask the question then, what exactly is so key about this that they would do that kind of extreme measure to someone who was fairly innocent. She was an innocent bystander who learned something, and she was going to talk about it. This is the $600 trillion question. There's a multi-trillion dollar interest group, the military industrial complex, that's very attached to having the next war be interplanetary. Uh, we had, uh, of course, Douglas MacArthur on his last speech to uh, the world uh, from the well of the Congress. This is a matter of the, in the congressional record said in the 1960s, World War III will be interplanetary. A very bizarre thing. People said, what in the world is this man talking about? And it was by then that the plans had been put in place that Werner von Braun, who, of course, as you all know, invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, and became the core of our space program in the United States after the OSS put Operation Paperclip in place to bring the brilliant Nazi scientists into the United States, and Werner von Braun was one of them. And he told uh, his assistant uh, for many years, uh, Carol Rosen, who's one of our uh, top uh, secret disclosure project witnesses, that in fact a plan had been hatched in the 50s to hijack this subject and to put out the disinformation so that the people eventually would accept that there was an enemy in, in space and that the, they would attempt to create an interplanetary conflict. So as we drive around LA and we see all these billboards about invasion LA and we hear all the speakers at this conference and others talk about the good aliens and the bad aliens and the whole Manichaean worldview, we realize that the indoctrination of the mind of the human species is almost complete. But be careful. Let's not unite the world against what Werner von Braun warned about, the false alien threat. This is the biggest problem with disclosure. This is the hugest problem. For years, I've thought of retiring from doing any of this because so much of my work has been hijacked by charlatans who have then turned it into alien invasion or invasion LA. 
And you know, people come to my things, they find information, and they turn it into a horror flick. They take the stuff we've done, and they turn it into another book, and they'll tell you that the evil reptilians and the greys are here to eat us for lunch, and the, the, the Venusians and the ones that look like they came from Scandinavia are our friends, and, we have, and we're going to have this big... This is all part of a Manichaean absurd paradigm propounded and, and, and actually forced out onto the public through either unwitting dupes of the intelligence community or the intelligence community itself. And the purpose of it is to cause people to have a new enemy. And even if you say, well, there are a thousand ET species out there that are good, but there are a couple that are bad and we need to resist them and fight them, they've got you. They've got you in the Manichaean, they've got the new enemy. And that's what they want you to believe. This is why so much work went into PLFs, program life forms. And if you look at the videotapes of some of the things like what Stan Romanek, who I've been at his home, that one that's in his kitchen that's going like this, that's actually one of the PLFs. And the intelligence community had called him up and said, this, just Stan, this is one of the fake ones. Now, he may have had real contact. I don't know. But I know what that one was. That was a robotic, artificial ET, what I call an alien. See, ETs are extraterrestrial interstellar civilization. Aliens, if you use the word alien, you're talking about the man-made stuff. Because alien is a xenophobic negative word, so I never use it. To me, it's like a, it's a, it's a, a racist term, alien. I never use it. So the, 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 the thing that are the aliens are the greys and the reptilian and these other creatures that we've been manufacturing. Now, when did we start doing this? back in the 40s and 50s. So the facility at Dulce, at the Four Corners area, is a genetics lab. There's a genetics facility at Sandia. Uh, there's a facility in, in uh, Australia. There's a, a group of physicists I know who work there. And there are these things that look like greys and others coming off a conveyor belt. And they have integrated circuits in their neural complex. And they're put on board these ARVs that look like UFOs. And they use electromagnetic weapon systems and chemicals. And they abduct people. That's what happened to Paris de Cuellar. So one of the, and then they have implants. Now the implants, if you look at the, <laughs> the implants that are being made, EG and G and a group of other high-tech electronic firms, these systems, have been making these in Siemens for decades. If you look at the tape we just released, posthumously, from a guy named Pollock, disclosureproject.org, top secret guy, he had worked with a man who developed, back in the 70s, some of the uh, implants that they began to uh, mass produce. At Siemens made about two billion of them at the time. And these are implants that are RF frequency, radio frequency, um, and they, tr they both connect to satellites, but they can receive signals. And they can affect on a scalar level of what are called psychotronic and radionic type of, of effects. These are the ones that are being put in people. And you know, the, the folks who are extracting them, I've, you know, I, I've looked at the data on it. And I'm going, yeah, but I know who's manufacturing this. Now, what they're going to do is say, see, the aliens have done this. So this is the cosmic 9-11 that none of you know about and that no one wants to talk about. And this is why I've been blacklisted off of George Nury's show, because I talked about this. Coast to Coast won't let me on because I've revealed this. I had a man who was on the planning committee in 1974 for the intelligence community and the corporate aerospace world who came to the briefings we put together for Congress in 1997. This man had sat on the committee where they had put together everything needed so that they could hoax an invasion of Earth 100% controlled by humans made 100% to look like aliens. And he said, every single world leader will be deceived by it. That was fully operational by 1974 that he knew of, and I have learned before that. This is why we have to be extremely careful, I mean extremely careful, not to buy into the xenophobia and the fear. Because I can tell you right now, the only thing we have to fear are our fellow humans on this. And the extraterrestrial civilizations, every single one of them that we've had contact with, are peaceful, understand cosmic awareness, they're trans-dimensional, and let's face it, if they wanted to make trouble for us, it'd be over. I want to talk about this for a moment, because everyone looks at too much science fiction and too many UFO videos and books. 
If you have the ability to travel faster than the speed of light through interstellar space, do you really think that they would have waited till now, if they were hostile, to take the Earth? And by the way, what is on this planet that they need? If you're able to go faster than the speed of light and materialize an entire spacecraft vedically from infra-ultrasound, they're not here, Zachary Sitch, and I'm sorry to tell you, to have, gold, have monkeys pull gold out of the ground. They don't need my sperm and your eggs. I got news for you. Don't flatter yourself, honey. <laughs> your junk ain't that good. And they, you know, my daughter has a PhD in, 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 in genetics and neuroscience. We'd laugh. You know, you can take a, a, a epithelial cell, and all your genes are in there. And with the technology they have, they could clone you and you and you and you they, if they wanted to. They don't need to drag you on board a spacecraft and extract your eggs and sperm. This is being done as part of the parallel government's paradigm of fear. None of it makes any sense if you know the least scintilla about science. So the actual extraterrestrials that are here are universally peaceful. There is a hierarchy. They're at here on a coordinated system with what I call the guardians of Earth, which are the God consciousness civilizations that are the progenitors of life on Earth. There are ones who are concerned about what we're doing to the Earth because the Earth is precious and sacred. And they're concerned what we might do if we escape the biosphere and end up out in their solar system creating the havoc that we've created on Earth. But the fact that they're concerned about our hostility does not make them hostile. Don't conflate the two. You understand? Daniel All right, Coulter. well, hold on, hold on, hold on a name. I'll tell you what, you're calling about Dr. Greer, right? Yes, I am. All right. I'm, you know, I've interviewed Dr. Greer uh, over the years, right? Yes, sir. And I've always warned Dr. Greer that what he's doing, in other words, if everything Dr. Dr. Greer is doing is real, he's in jeopardy. He's potentially in jeopardy. If he's going to pry a secret from the government that they don't want pried open, then he's in jeopardy, isn't he? That is so true. All right, I want you to listen to something. All righty. All right, I want you to listen very carefully to what, what I'm about to play, and then I want to get your reaction to it. This appeared on Dr. Greer's telephone. Mail for... C SETI number That's three zero one two four nine three nine one five recorded message dated July nineteenth, two thousand four. At time is twelve thirty five AM. Seventh. Saved message. Stop crying into the government matters or dire consequences will result. Dire July cons dire 19, consequences. 12, listen listen carefully. Five AM. Here we go. Four is not a valid entry. To repeat this message... And here it, here it comes. Stop crying into the government matters or dire consequences will result. All right, there you've got it. Stop prying into government matters or dire consequences will result. If you got that on your phone, how would you feel if you were Dr. Greer?